being spiritual doesn't mean that you have to stop going to concerts or cut out sugar or you know wear certain clothing um, and so I think there's a place where when we think about being spiritual or we go down a spiritual path it feels like we have to cut out all the rest of our regular life Hi, everybody. I would like to welcome Spirit Bird. And Spirit Bird is a shamanic teacher, a plant medicine guide, and a best-selling author. And I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome for, for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of just jump in because we have a really broad range of topics to cover. And I also, I just want to throw in that I, I think it's really important for people like us to understand not only our spiritual path, but when we get to a certain point, there's always the question of, am I, you know, what am I supposed to do with this knowledge and this wisdom? Am I going to become a teacher? Am I going to present myself in a certain way or do I just stay in the background? And so not only are we going to talk about what you do and your background, but we're going to lead into the way that you formed your business and how you've become successful in doing that as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So um, let's start out just with a little bit about your journey and tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to this place where you are now. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was reflecting on that and I I think I didn't really consider myself to be spiritual at all until I was probably a teenager and then I started to really identify with that term and the the doorway that opened that for me was was med meditation learning about that and then I got interested in that and eastern philosophy and when I pursued that, I always really enjoyed it. And I was kind of always a person that was really connected to nature. And um, I felt rather in tune with things. But as a young person, I, we didn't really have words to describe that. And that wasn't really like part of conversation with like, oh, you're so in tune with nature, or you're so mm -hmm. in tune with the universe, or you're connected to your gifts. Um, and, and actually, um, it wasn't until later when I learned more about spirituality and spiritual gifts and learned about shamanism that that rounded out my perspective. And I was able to look back and realize that I'd had pretty clear connection to spiritual gifts from as, as a young kid, which a lot of us actually do, right? Most of mm -hmm. us have pretty strong connections. The veil is really thin when we're young. Um, sometimes we call it imagination and sometimes we're talking to things that we can sense that maybe adults can't sense. And so that's fairly normal. But for me, when I got to be the age when usually that starts to fade, it actually went the other direction for me and it started to get stronger. Oh. And so I started experiencing things that you would normally sense on a spiritual plane in the physical plane. So I was literally seeing spirits and I was literally hearing them. And I was uh, uh, in high school and it was very disorienting and very distracting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it actually kind of led to uh, a mental health crisis or that was the best way we could describe it at the time. And there was, I was experiencing some depression and anxiety, but also the experiences of the spiritual realm that I was having there was really no context for what that was. And yeah. the only place to put that was in mental health. And so, so I really got caught in this trap where I was feeling a little disoriented and a little bit overwhelmed, but I also knew I wasn't crazy. Um, when I was seeing things and hearing things, I knew that it was outside of the normal rational experience. And so that alone, you know, kind of kept me grounded and centered and aware that, um, you know, that, I, that I, I had some awareness of what was going on. I was like, this isn't right. I'm seeing this, but this is unusual. Mm -hmm. so, so that was really the introduction to my journey. And, you know, it was around that time that my previous history with, you know, pretty intensive studies with East Asian philosophy mixed with my gifts really coming online and intensifying 
mixed with this mental health crisis actually dropped me off into um, a lot of curiosity about consciousness in general, mm-hmm. which I think is also true for a lot of people that are interested in the spiritual path. That might be, you might relate as well, Lisa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I'm curious to know, because you were talking about um, at, you know, when you were a teenager, you were doing, you were, you were getting into the Eastern philosophies and meditation, which is extremely unusual for a teenager. How was that introduced to you? You know, I actually, I actually do remember um, there was a book, it was, it's not an East Asian philosophy book at all. But there was a book that my grandmother gave me in middle school. Um, it's The Education of Little Tree. It's a pretty well-known lit- literary book. Yeah. That book mentioned meditation. Oh. And so I was like, what's that? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's actually like afterwards when I look back, I realized there probably were some, some tendencies that I had that were a little unusual. But I didn't really track them at the time. Um, I was having prophetic dreams when I was little, where I would experience something in my dream and then tell my mom and then it would happen. Um, You know, I was Mm -hmm. pretty in tune. I could tell, sense people's feelings. Um, And I think I even remember having kind of my first ceremony. I was raised in a a Catholic family. We're kind of half-hearted Catholics, but we definitely did church on Sundays, but it was okay Mm -hmm. if we didn't go, you know, it was like kind of important, but also like not super important. And I hated it. I hated it as a kid, you know, as as a lot of young kids do. But I I remember this moment where I suddenly got kind of curious about it. There was something about the spirituality that started to intrigue me. And Mm -hmm. whatever reason that around that time when my curiosity hit, we, we didn't go for a couple of weeks. And so I remember having a little ceremony in my bedroom. I had a little, probably like a little unlit candle and I had my little rosary out and I probably had little trinkets that I had made in a circle. And I remember just kind of, and I played this requiem and I just had this little ceremony to myself. And I think part of it came from being around the church, but I also think part of it was just kind of instinct, like almost memory. Yeah. 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 And it's so interesting that you're bringing this up because I, I've become more aware and I'm a lot older than you are, but <laughs> looking back, you know, looking back through all of the years, um, it's really become apparent to me at this, at this time that all of my basic foundation beliefs and the way that I've treated people and the actions that I've done, I'm really finding that it's the old knowledge that was within me that was coming to the surface without me even recognizing what was happening. This is just the way that I am. And, you know, and in doing this, you know, obviously you were bringing up the core of who you are, your soul's connection to your past lives and what you were bringing forward. And we don't really recognize, we just use that term, well, this is just the way I am, or this is just the way I believe and not recognizing, oh, wait a minute, maybe we came into this earth with this and it's a lot closer to the surface than we give it the credit for. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an interesting journey when you can look back and say, I've always known this, <laughs> but I didn't realize it. Of course. Um, so where did that lead you? Um, because, you know, your name Spirit Bird, obviously it was given to you in some way, shape, form or fashion. And so what, you know, what kind of took you down the path once you recognize that the spirituality is a pretty big part of who you are? Then where did you go from there? Yeah, well, I I ended up um, following that trail in my higher education. Um, And I I think I was probably always a person that I'm interested in a lot of things, a lifelong learner. But again, this consciousness was something that was really interesting to me. And so was religion and various forms of spirituality. So when I was when I was in my undergrad, actually, similar, I haven't actually thought about this, but I came across shamanism also in a book. I was doing this whole six month study on dreams and Jungian psychology. And one of the books on the science of sleep that I was reading mentioned a shaman at the University of Arizona. And so mm-hmm. I was like, what is that? And it was early on in Google days. Um, mm-hmm. And there weren't a lot of programs like that that were easily accessible at the time. 
But same thing, I was just curious and I found a workshop in a town nearby a few weeks later and I signed up for it. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it was very much um, a rounding out of my spirituality and my spiritual understanding. I loved meditation. I loved Eastern philosophies. Obviously, that's a really big range. Eastern philosophies, there's lots of things within that that can be vastly different from, mm -hmm. from piece to piece. But what I found in at least the practice of meditation, and at least the way we do it generally in the United States, is that it was super helpful, lots of benefits, really loved it. And I also felt like there was a part of my soul that wasn't really quenched by mm -hmm. the spirituality. And what I found with the shamanic work is it kind of rounded that out for me, where it brought more of the sort of a, a feminine way of being and interacting with the world into my spiritual practice. And so I actually continued to train. I followed that train for a, a while, um, really just for my own personal reasons. There wasn't any talk of doing things professionally. Um, I, I knew it was kind of helping me heal, but I, I don't think I would have even said that at the time that I'm going here because I'm healing. I just liked it. I found mm -hmm. it fascinating. I found it fun. And I knew every time I went to a workshop and learned more, I came back feeling more centered, more uh, connected to myself and more in my power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how did the name Spirit Bird come around? So this is actually, I, I took this on a few years ago. It's actually relatively new in my life. Um, and I don't know if I shared this story with you, Lisa, but it, it came about in a training. And I'll just caveat this with, as <clears throat> part of part of one of the teachings that I got. Um, there's a phrase um, that's like, um, whenever you cast a judgment, you're inviting, you know, that experience to come to you. Mm -hmm. And so I was one of those people that was like, I would never be like one of those silly white girls taking on a spiritual name. Like that's <laughs> not ever, I would never ever do that. That's so wrong. Oh. <laughs> so that snake I was carrying around bit me. <laughs> and it was really a beautiful teaching in lots of ways. Um, it came in during a training. Um, I'd been uh, working with a group for a while. And part of the practice is to when you're sharing, you know, share at the, with like whatever is most forward for you, whatever is actually there in your mind versus, you know, a lot of times when we talk, we rehearse what we're going to say or we're mm -hmm. ahead about what we want to say. And this was really a practice of speaking directly what's coming through. And part of the practice was to introduce yourself. And I just felt this tap that was like, say spirit bird, say spirit bird. And so I did. And when I did, um, I really felt this like homecoming. And I remember mm -hmm. kind of seeing that in the people that heard me say it too, where it was sort of like, there was almost like this truth landed. And then I started a year and a half journey with it of accepting that, learning who mm -hmm. that is, learning how to be in the world as that person, I think really coming more fully into myself. And then eventually I started taking it on publicly. And that was kind of my, what I was struggling with a little bit is like, I really, for me, I don't want to be, have this name with only certain people in only certain places. Yeah. I would like to either have it everywhere or not. And yeah. now it's okay if my grandma doesn't call me spirit bird. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it was a practice and asking for how I want to be called mm -hmm. and, you know, and sharing that with people and dropping my, my own judgment and dropping my fear of what I thought other people would think about it. Well, this is going down a road that I wasn't planning on, <laughs> but I really think it's important. And the reason why is because names are significant, mm -hmm. you know, to who we are as spiritual beings and, and the guidance that the names give us. And if you look through, there's so many different techniques and um, ways that the vibration of the name resonate with the truth of who we are. And, you know, there's, there's soul purpose readings that go specifically from, you know, your name and all of it's, you know, it's almost like our name is as significant as the astrology that goes with our birth date. And so many people don't realize that. And so I, I'm building on this because you brought up some key points in owning the name Spirit Bird. And I, I know that 
you know, for and and I'm I'm saying this from my perspective. My my legal name, my legal last name is actually Otero. Mm-hmm. O, it's Lisa Otero. Otero was my second ex husband's name. And so when I think of Otero, I think of an individual that is of a very low energy, low vibration. And it makes me get a knot in my stomach when I say that name. Mm-hmm. Wetzel is my maiden name. Wetzel is my birth name. And so when I say my full birth name, I feel my heart open up mm-hmm. and I can feel the difference in a name that. I took on from somebody else being a woman, you know how this goes, you take on your partner's last name and it it takes away your identity to an extent. And, you know, and it may not be for everybody, but it's something that I've really figured out that it did for me. But I also recognize that the name Spirit Bird came to you because it was a core of who you are. And so you talked about owning that name and being able to accept it and to make it public. Mm-hmm. And so tell me a little bit about the the thoughts and the process that you went through to get to the stage of owning that name. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the thing I struggled with the most, my biggest fear, honestly, was I was afraid that if I came forward with that name, people would think I was trying to get attention. Mm -hmm. That was, that was kind of the, you know, subconscious block for me around it or the distortion around it for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some people think that I've actually interacted with some people that are like, is that part of your shtick? You know, and it's like, it's actually just who I am. (laughs) (laughs) It's just that that's, there's nothing more to it. Yeah. Um, So I did have to, I think throughout that process, having that belief come up over and over again um, really required me to look at it closer Mm -hmm. and really decide if it was actually true. Am I actually doing this for attention? Well, well, no, I'm not. I'm sitting here for a year and a half fighting against it because I don't want that. Mm -hmm. So even though that fear was present, I mean, I kind of had to just use my rational brain to get outside of um, my subconscious spinning around it. And yeah. you're like, you know what? This isn't actually true. Some people will think that that's going to happen, but for me, it's not actually true. Mm-hmm. But isn't it important that <clears throat> you know you're afraid of judgment because because of this, mm-hmm. and how important it is for us to really look at what's blocking us for being our true selves, the fear of judgment, yeah, and how significant that is that because we're afraid of what other people will think, which is going to lead us into a whole nother conversation. But because we're afraid of what people think, we hide our true identity and we don't stand in the truth of who we, who we really are and who we're meant to be because of that fear and how important it is for us to be able to work through that and stand in our own truth and, and honor ourselves and ignore the other beliefs. But also, if you're that individual that's saying, I'm going to put a label on you or I'm going to judge you for your name or your journey, then we need to do some inner work and work on ourselves on top of that. So I do want to make there's there's two sides to the story that we all need to look at, you know, for that. Yeah. So anyway, so I honor you for owning, you. owning the name and standing in the truth of who you are and who you were meant to be. So congratulations. Yay for all of us. <laughs> well, so. and I have a quick anecdote that I'll, I'll try to make quick because I know we're kind of spinning here, but um, it, it really rounds out the story. So when I was into using it publicly, I was actually at an event and it was kind of the first time I was meeting a bunch of people. I had it on my name tag. Um People had already known me by my previous name. I was a little nervous about it. Long story short, a woman that I had dinner next to one night came to me the next morning and she said, I I need to share something with you, but not right now because I'm going to cry. I was like, okay, sure. (laughs) And later the afternoon during a workshop, she actually got up and and shared with the group that when she was younger, she had had, uh, lost a child and, Mm -hmm. you know, had gone through the grieving process. It had been decades, but that 
a few years ago, she was in a meditation. And during the meditation, she got a message that said, someday your daughter will return. And like a spirit bird, you'll know that your daughter is okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Gives me chills. Oh, I love it. I love it. What a great gift. And, and so again, we- yeah, you know, and you owning your truth. And so that, you know, it's such a bigger picture than just us. And we don't understand how all of this is intertwined. And so now you're taking me down another <laughs> side note. <laughs> but, you know, but what we what we have to recognize is that we get, you know, it's, it's so important to see these little signs and these little symbols. Mm-hmm. And when you can really start following these paths and you recognize what she did, what a great gift. She had this, she had this, um, well, a dream or message in which I'm choosing to say that, you know, her guides provided this information. And then you doing your job, you know, you following your guidance and you following that, that specific role that was meant for you was, you know, was a, a part of what this other individual was supposed to receive and how important it is to see how we are so intertwined that we don't normally recognize it or so many things that we just ignore Mm -hmm. and in an everyday thing you know obviously you know her having spirit bird specifically and your name being spirit bird bird it threw it out to her more easily than what more of the subtle messages might be. But I always think it's important for us all to open, open ourselves up to see, see how we are so intertwined in so many different ways and how messages are constantly being given to us. We just have to be open to receive it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> let's, let's pull back on the highway here and get down <laughs> get down the path that I was actually meant meant for or meant to stay on. Um, okay. So the other thing is, is that, you know, because you moved into this spiritual journey, um, what do you feel that is the most important step into moving, moving to moving? I, 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 my words are not coming out. Sorry. What is the most important step into moving into our, our spiritual growth. And I think it's, and this isn't just for you. It's like, what is your um, vision of all of us being able to step into the spiritual growth? I think the most important step, honestly, is really deciding that you value it. Mm. Um, for a lot of us, you know, we get different signs and information or things happen in our life where we know we want to explore, we want to grow, or we know we need some help or some healing. And we often put it at the end of the list of things mm-hmm. to do or things to support us. And, you know, and I think just like acknowledging that it does have value and is really the first step. And there are so many different ways to go with it. But if you believe that it's sort of an afterthought to everything else that's important, then um, it's almost backwards, you know, and when we go into this first, when we make this the center point, and it doesn't have to, we can do it in a lot of different ways. It doesn't mean we all need to become monks, right? It's just, it's just allowing it to be authentic and allowing that spirituality to be part of your life and part of the forefront then informs all of the other things, your relationship, your business, your purpose, your understanding of the world, and it just helps us live better lives. Yeah. So because, you know, that's such a good point, because we as humans have the tendency to put others in front of us. Um, I'm, I'm living my life for my job. I'm living my life for my spouse. I'm living my life for my kids. I'm trying to satisfy all my friends and acquaintances. And everything is on the forefront. So how do you see how to balance th- this dynamic that society has kind of pushed us into in being able to move our spirituality to the front and kind of soften all of the other things and putting them behind us? Well, there's a piece of it that I think is a, a natural bridge that probably both extremes of the, the very spiritual and the very non-spiritual keep missing And that is that integration piece where, again, being spiritual doesn't mean that you have to stop going to concerts or cut out sugar 
or, Mm -hmm. you know, wear certain clothing. Um, And so I think there's a place where when we think about being spiritual or we go down a spiritual path, it feels like we have to cut out all the rest of our regular life. Mm -hmm. And for me, I actually think a lot of the reason that I'm interested in spirituality well, part of it is just because it's fun and interesting to me and and, and it helps me. I, it's fulfilling because it allows me to use part of my brilliance that no other part of life allows me to use. Mm. But it's also helps me with my daily life, with like my actual literal everyday activities and way that I'm relating with people and my feelings and, you know, and my general sense of peace and joy Um, so I I think that it's helpful to keep that in mind. And sometimes when we go down the spiritual path, we can stray away from that and forget that it is actually okay to utilize spiritual tools just to help you with your life right now. Okay. Now you just opened another door. (laughs) So how, how, how do you do that? So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like, how do you integrate, um, the spirituality part in our everyday lives? Mm. Um, You know, I think where I would point people is um, creating a connection between your, your self-awareness, your, you know, the way you're experiencing yourself, what's happening inside your head and maybe things that you want to be different in your external reality is a pretty common way to find that bridge. So that might look like um, if you find yourself, um, you know, people pleasing a lot, for example, and you're starting to feel it affect your daily life. Now you're saying yes to showing up uh, to staying after at work, or you're going to a family member's party that you really don't want to go to, and you're finding yourself doing things you don't want to do. That's how it starts to intrude in your daily life. And so, a simple way to access that spirituality is to begin to look at the internal part of you and like what part of you is agreeing to to doing this thing that you don't want to do. And this is kind of where that spirituality and sometimes psychology can blend Mm -hmm. where we can track, okay, what actually happened that created this pattern in me? And can I go back and rework that and realize there's parts of those of that past story, whether it's in this life or past life um, that I can change my belief around now. I can experience in a different way because I'm a different person now than I was five minutes ago, Mm -hmm. which means that the way I understand that past situation is also going to be different. So it's a very quick way actually to shift, um, shift our reality. Yeah. So that, again, that that's taken us down another direction of belief systems. Mm -hmm. And so for, for you, um, how, how do you feel that belief systems um, need to be addressed in, mm-hmm. in the spiritual life? And how, how do you think that the belief systems affect us mm-hmm. in our daily lives? Ooh, that's a big one. There's lots of different ways we can look at this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what comes to mind for me first, Lisa, is... Um, is less about, you know, religions or politics or anything like that. And more about what we think is true. Um, that might not be. And actually my partner and I teach this quite a bit. And so it might be helpful here. I think one of the easiest ways to start practicing this is we have like on a spectrum, we have, um, being in the question curiosity. And then on the other end, we have knowing, And they both have uh, gifts and they both have distortions. And so if you're always in the knowing, if you're like, I'm right, I know the way, this is the way you sweep a floor, (laughs) you know, (laughs) this is the way you load a dishwasher, right? Um, It can, it can feel like a sense of control. um, And so it might be how you're keeping yourself safe and comfortable, but it actually causes stress for everybody else around you which eventually usually comes back on you. Mm -hmm. And so if you find yourself in this belief system, that's like, this is the way, then there's an invitation here to get curious. Is that true? And and ask, keep asking yourself more questions. Why is it true? What would happen if it wasn't true? Right. And then on the other end of the spectrum, some of us are super curious, which is certainly a gift, but in a kind of distorted version, then it can look like, 
never being able to make a decision, being confused all the time. Which way do I go? What do I do? Right. And so this is where we can then lean into that other side of the spectrum with the knowing. And so if your your belief system is like always shifting or always based on some external thing in order for you to make a decision, you can start to lean into that knowing more to sort of get yourself out of that belief system. And usually that's rooted in this idea that um, the way it would look in normal life is like, well, I'll decide what to eat after you tell me what you want to eat. You know, or why don't I, everybody else tell me what you want to do first and then I'll decide what I want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's important because just what you said, we do it all the time and we don't, we don't really recognize how many of these belief systems that we have that are so basic. Mm-hmm. You know, we usually look at, oh, this belief system has to be of this huge magnitude. It has to be a religious belief. It has to be, you know, ethical beliefs. It has to be this thing that is huge. But we don't realize these little ingrainments that we've been experiencing from the time that we're born. Mm-hmm. You know, how we start developing the same habits that our parents do or said, you know, this is how, and it's passed, been passed down through generations and how controlling and restrictive these beliefs can be. And they hold us in this specific pattern that we don't see that there's, I always see it like, it's like wearing your iron, your armor, you know, like when you're a, a knight in the knight in armor, shining armor, but I'm not seeing it as shiny. (laughs) I'm seeing it as very dingy and not shiny. And so when we think about why do you do this? Well, it's because I always have. Well, what if you let that go and just allow yourself just kind of go with the flow instead? You drive to the grocery store the same way every day, but there's something inside you that says, hey, take a right here. Can't do that because I have to go straight. You know, so these little belief systems that keep holding us in that same pattern that we can't see that, no, there's a detour you can take and everything inside of you is telling you to take it. So let it let that belief go and just be adventurous and try it and see what happens. (laughs) And I always look at it as it's an adventure. Just try it and see. And you can always put it back. You can always put it back. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, so these belief systems are, you know, they're, they're so expansive, just like we said, they can start from the smallest belief system that we don't even realize that we're doing to something that is a huge, um, you know, this is my core value of the, my religious beliefs or the way that people should act, the way people should dress, the way that, you know, what this gives me status if I do this, you know, so it goes from the smallest to the biggest. So when, if I'm choosing to let go of some of these belief systems, what tools would you recommend using in order to do this? Mm -hmm. There, there are lots of different tools, definitely, definitely that introspection piece and beginning to see if you can locate where those belief systems came from, either from, um, from a memory, from something that happened to you, or often from, you know, from our family or the community that we grow up in have these belief systems. And there's probably phrases that you hear, um, you know, like common ones are, um, uh, you know, uh, you should, uh, this is why you can't have anything nice, right, would be one, right, that we actually don't realize that we've taken on and now it's like actually living in our body and in our energy. So actually just being able to notice I almost think of them as like inner thoughts, these like this kind of like narration that may be happening throughout your daily life. That's a great way to begin to locate and extract them. Um, The other place you might notice is when you start to desire something and you kind of hit these blocks. Um, And this can look like, um, you know, actually it would feel really nice if I didn't have to worry about what I looked when I went out in public. Or it might look like actually... I really want to, you know, do this professionally. And you might notice that it shows up as like envy from someone else who's doing it. And so this is where I think that piece around the judgment and the tool that I use a lot, I call it um, walking around the circle. So there's this idea that, you know, I'm here on this side of the circle and I'm looking across at this person on the other side that's at another point in their life with completely different circumstances. 
And I might be looking at them and thinking, this is so misguided or, you know, why are they acting the way they are? Um, and eventually life will bring you around to that side of the circle so you can experience something close to what they're experiencing to develop compassion. And this is where you can also change your beliefs. So if you hold those beliefs all the way around, then you're going to be stuck. You're going to be angry. You're going to be blocked. Um, and likely you're going to find that things aren't going the way you'd like them to go in your life. So that's another place where it's like when that's happening, that's a really big signal to start doing that inner work and introspection and and opening it up, playing with your beliefs. Um, and so I find that to be really helpful um, and also just kind of giving yourself permission to, to be where you're at. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, how do, how do, how does a person dis discern between belief systems and going with the flow? And is it possible to let go of enough belief systems to go with the flow and allow things just to un unravel in front of you? Well, it certainly is. I'll add that I think what's helpful here is understanding that we are going to, we all have different paths. So here again is kind of that spectrum where you have two different sides. So you might be on a side where you are wanting everything to have a plan. You're wanting a lot of structure. You're wanting to kind of have control of the situation. And, you know, you were talking about the armor and that's the thing is like, when we're wearing that, it's safety at one point, but eventually it just gets heavy and becomes a burden. So if you're finding yourself being one that always wants to have control, um, then that, you know, that's just the thing is like actually try on something different. And I recommend starting with something little. So if you're, you know, um, if you are trying to work, you know, I remember doing this with a, a previous partner where I started to notice kind of where I would go along with what he wanted and regardless of what I wanted. And if I had gone to something like really triggering or extreme first, I probably would have scared myself. But I started with lunch, you know, like actually I don't want sushi for lunch, I want this. So this is one way, this is a huge tool that can help you is like, right, when you're driving, when you're driving to the grocery store, like practice that, you've got that nudge, like why not? Actually, it's not gonna hurt anything. And let me at least just try it and see mm -hmm. and let yourself test it. Now, there's also the other side. So some of us are very with the flow. And this can also be like, this is certainly a gift. And also it can be kind of a, a wound too, where we're like, well, everything, whatever's happens is supposed to happen. And we become kind of like, we end up getting tumbled along with life instead of having our own authority and sovereignty in our life and our decisions. Mm -hmm. And so if you're finding yourself in that place uh, where you're always going with the flow, where you feel like um, you're not naming your desires or having like any control, then you might want to take a step in that direction towards the control side or towards the structure side, I think is probably a nicer way to say it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And actually like try having a plan with something, try making lists or having a plan and setting a date and saying, this is when I'm going to do something by and just try it out and see, you'll find that actually most of us have these beliefs that it's going to be devastating. And when we can give ourselves an opportunity to practice, just stepping in that direction a little bit, we'll see it's not actually devastating at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost practice. just, it's kind of trying to find a nice balance between the two mm -hmm. and then, and being able to push your comfort zones. Mm -hmm. you know, and kind of get out of that box, but then finding this place of comfort that's a balance between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, one of the other things that we really want to talk about is business. And so, and, and the reason why, again, is like what we said at the beginning of this conversation, there's a lot of us that are on this spiritual journey that are just evolving in this crazy fast rate. And we understand that our spiritual growth is really meant to be in order to help others shift as well. And this is the time that we're in. And I call it the first waivers. And, you know, we we are there's so many. I mean, I just keep talking to people one after another that are right there on that line of shifting over into this fifth dimensional energy. 
And we're the first ones. And we're this beginning front, front line that's doing this. And so when we talk about evolving, there's so many questions, again, about what do I do with this? Now that I recognize who I am and what I'm here for, what do I do with it? And you have, you have established your, your way of doing things so that you can share your message. And this is through your business. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about, number one, what you do and how how you would structure or advise other people to structure and start start a business of their own sure yeah well i i train healers i teach healers um i um teach people about shamanism and in particular one of my specialties is helping people understand how to you un use their unique gifts their evolutionary gifts in their daily life and i'll i'll say i think about you know, this question about what do we do with them? I think that we all actually have like different levels. There's different kinds of purpose. So there's like the career, what we're actually doing to make a living. And then there's sort of the divine purpose. And we maybe have more of a cosmic purpose too. And so if you're called to the spiritual path, um, it's not always going to be for your career. And so I just want to name that because it doesn't have to be for it to be important or valuable or be impactful in your life and the life of people around you. If you are called to that, if you do want that to be part of your life, um, I think for one thing, just knowing that you have that calling, if you notice that you keep imagining yourself doing it or it keeps coming into your thoughts, then that alone is just confirmation that you're meant to do it. It's actually just that simple. And all of us are going to have things that we need to develop in order for us to, to realize like our next level of ourselves or our higher potential, right? So some of us are going to have to learn different sides of the business. Some of us are going to have to learn more about actually how to use our spiritual gifts. Others are going to have to learn maybe about technology. You know, we don't usually come into the world knowing all of this. So that's a really important step because I think I see a lot of people hit that wall where they feel like they should know it all or feel like they need to do it all themselves and just know that that's very, very rare. And so it's completely uh, appropriate to ask for help uh, at some point on that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have lots of people that help me <laughs> because my, my technology expertise is <laughs> <laughs> and in the way that the world is, you know, now is that everything is, you know, technology and there's professionals in the field wow. and, you know, and being able to to network. And the other thing, too, is that we're since we're talking about this, you know, is a lot of people, you know, they feel like oh, well, I can't afford to hire somebody to do this for me. Well, that's when you start networking. Mm -hmm. And do you ever barter with people? Um, I don't. <laughs> um, I, you know, when I first started, though, I did a little bit. Um, I'm certainly not saying it's wrong. It's just for me, the energetics don't quite work. Um, but certainly when you're starting, um, I think that it's important to do something for mm -hmm. sure. And that's a great way to start moving, moving the needle in where you want to go. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a beginning point. And, you know, and a lot of times when when we are first starting our our businesses, that we don't have a lot of extra discretionary income to be throwing out, you know, out at other people. And, you know, for me, I, I have another job. I, I had a second job and, you know, that's what financed my expenses. So, you know, in order to do what I do, you know, I had to take the income from my other job and then put it into this business to get it started. So there's, you know, there's ways to work around getting done what you need to get started. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what, what was your path in, in starting your business and getting it to where it is today? And what do you do? What, I mean, like, as far as your marketing or your promotion or Tell us everything. Sure. <laughs> Give us a down and dirty. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, you know, I'll say when I started my business, when I actually way back when I was doing the shamanic training and in, more intensively, I was in program for three or four years and then did other programs after that. 
So that was a major part of my life. And again, it was really just for my own personal benefit, healing, um, healing and growth. And, um, you know, when I had people that kept telling me, you know, you should be, you know, a spiritual coach or something like that. And this was also before that term was really well known. And I remember thinking, well, I would love that if somebody would hire me. Um, and it took me a while to realize, oh, I've got to be the one to actually step forward and say what I do. And this opened up this whole block around spirituality and and money and, um, you know, probably a little piece that I talked about earlier with being afraid that it looked like I wanted attention. Mm -hmm. And so I did have to learn that actually money is okay. Actually, money is wonderful. It's a wonderful tool. Um, I had to realize we we're talking about beliefs. And I started to see all of these beliefs that I had, like I could hear them. I could hear these beliefs from books I read or movies that I watched or trainings that were, that I was in where people would say things like you would never, it would be inappropriate to call yourself a shaman. You wouldn't do that. And you would, wouldn't charge money. And that if you do charge money, that it means you're not actually helping people. Like all of mm -hmm. these beliefs that I could hear, like I could hear them in the voices that I took them on from and realized that's not my voice actually. Hold on, let me take a look at this. And so I started to realize that, you know, that was what I was going to have to move through. Mm -hmm. Some of us are going to deal with things like be, it, being afraid of judgment. What will people think? We all kind of have our own different version of why we might be tentative to move forward. So if you're on that, then I would say definitely look because that's really hard to bypass. Um, that being said, um, I eventually, like I had tried a few different things. I was actually living on the road at the time. Um, I could feel something growing in me. I could feel an offer growing in me and I had so many interests. I didn't really know what it was. Um, and eventually I kind of, as I kept playing with other things, I kept coming back to this place of shamanic healing and that I love working with the spirit realms. I love teaching people how to navigate the different spirit realms and um you know how to work with your guides to bring healing to yourself and the people around you and um and i had to move i had to just acknowledge that's actually what i really want and part of that block was thinking that i just wasn't allowed to mm -hmm. so there was a permission piece for me there too with like actually i can that belief is actually not true at all mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah well, and I found that, <clears throat> so I, you know, I come from a massage therapy background. I went to massage therapy school in 1996 and I, so it's been a day or two, but back then even, I mean, there was that belief system of, you know, your, your, your gifts and your talents are worth something. Mm -hmm. And that belief system that I'm not spiritual if I charge money. And I, I hear that today all the time. And it's the belief system of <clears throat> that whatever's meant to be will be. And the people will come to you. But what people sometimes don't understand in that statement is that you cannot sit on your couch and, and hide. Mm -hmm. If the people don't know you're there, then the people don't know that what you can do for them. And so there is this point where number one, you've got to value yourself and who you are and the journey that you've gone through in order to share with others, but also being able to be out there and allowing people to find you so, so that this can happen. And there is, there is an intricate, well, I feel like there's an intricate part of where, what our journey is supposed to be and what our destiny is. But we have to play an active role in playing the scenario out. And you can't hide. If, if you hide or if you have fear or you're afraid to, you know, this belief system about money and you don't think that you can charge because of somebody else's belief system with that, then, then you're going to stay in the closet. And you're not going to give your gift to others because you're hiding. And, you know, in the way that our society is now is that it's really hard to make a living when you don't have an income. You know, it's really hard to do what our gifts are if you don't have an income. And that that just is what it is. And so we we really have to work on the spiritual belief of if you charge money, you're a shyster. 
yeah. you're a charlatan, you know, that you're not spiritual or you don't care about people. And that is literally a belief system. And it still comes up today all the time. I, I hear this, people saying this all the time. So mm-hmm. owning your own value is, is really important to me. And, you know, what, what you're saying and being able to put out your strengths to others so that you can share these gifts. Um, the other thing is, is what do you think is the biggest challenge in sharing your, your gifts in the business world? You know, I mean, I think actually a lot of that does come down to to kind of owning owning the value of what you offer. Um, I think for spiritual practitioners, the place is really staying centered in that. Um, it can be easy to come out of it or to devalue yourself because when we're doing spiritual work, the benefits, the value that people get is so far beyond something concrete and so far beyond um, losing 10 pounds or making an extra thousand dollars a month, you might get those benefits, but what we're actually delivering is so much more than that. And so it can be challenging to um, feel you can get lost easily and feeling that if people don't see that, then they don't see the value. And so that's something you really just have to hold for yourself. But I would say the other thing, if you're starting a spiritual business, what I would suggest, um, it's kind of related to just staying in yourself and in your beliefs um, about what you think, you're, what you're meant to do, um, because it can be easy when we're talking to other people and you hear one person say, oh, I really want this. And another person say, oh, I really want this. Um, I've gotten this lesson multiple times where I'll have a bunch of people that will say, oh, can you offer this thing? I would really love it. And I would totally sign up for it. And then I leave myself to create this thing that other people say they wanted and then they don't come mm-hmm. and that's not fun. Yeah, <laughs> that, and that happens a lot. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So you really got to stick to, um, you know, what your gifts are designed to do and what you get excited about offering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what I found is that for me, When I get in that business mode and I'm searching for what can I do next? What can I do next? What can I do next? I also find an uncomfortable feeling. Mm. It's like I start feeling a tightness in my stomach or a knot to where my ego's involved and that I'm trying to fit into the belief systems that were provided. I have a marketing background, you know, and I have, I've got a business background. And so, you know, when I look at, I got to do, I got to do, I got to do, I have to, you know, I've got to keep these things going and rolling. I found that for me as a spiritual worker, when it's not in alignment with who I am, that I start getting, I start feeling really uncomfortable about it. And my body starts shifting and changing and I get my, my shoulders start creeping up and I get that feeling. And I've learned through the years that you have to step back and take a deep breath. And if you stay in alignment with who you are and you stay in that comfort zone, it's going to play out. It may take a little bit longer than what you want it to, but I've witnessed it. I've lived it. And I am the testimony (laughs) and understanding. If it's meant to be, it's going to be. You just have to play your part. And, you know, so stay in alignment with who you are and just be careful, like like what you're saying, when you start going down somebody else's ideas or paths, and they're not really feeling right to you, recognize that feeling. It's called intuition. (laughs) Well, I hope to be successful too. You know, when I started, I didn't have, uh, I I mean, I was literally pretty darn close to broke. I did Mm -hmm. not have a bunch of money to use Mm -hmm. to invest in my business. And I was working pretty close to full time, and but I did have time a little bit. I mean, I had to, the point is, is that following your intuition and what is true for you is going to be really important because if you are starting a business, it does take work one way or the another. There is some investment, whether mm-hmm. it's time, whether it's money, um, lots of passion, <laughs> lots of heart. And so if it's not something that you truly, truly care about, you're not going to have the motivation that you actually need to move forward with it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so with with all of that and the success that you've had with your business, tell me a little bit about what you've done. Um, I know that you're an author and mm-hmm. you've written a book or two. 
or three? <laughs> how many how many books have you written? Just, just one, <laughs> one that's okay. formally, you know, physically published. <laughs> and what's the name of that book? It's called uh, Sacred Medicine. Okay. And where can people get that? Um, you can find it on Amazon for sure. And uh, you can find it on my website as well. Okay. Um, I write about uh, inner child retrieval around the process of finding those inner parts of yourself that were wounded and, and healing them. Good. So do you have any other advice that you'd want to share with others before we end this beautiful conversation? You know, I think I'd probably just like to reiterate what you named Lisa with, you know, if whether you're new to this or whether you're been around and you're finding yourself wanting to move into a new level or, you know, new version of yourself, um, I think the most important thing is to talk, to talk to other people. Mm -hmm. um, start with what's safer first. You know, if you're testing the edge of sharing some part of your inner thought that you feel uncomfortable sharing, don't go to the most triggering person or the biggest <laughs> skeptic. Um, but the more we talk to other people about the thoughts we have, the spiritual experiences we have, the intuitive hits we have, the more we start to see that we're actually tuning into a collective field and building something together, the more we're seeing that we're actually affirming things for each other and that you're not crazy at all. <laughs> and that's important. We're not crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a beautiful way to end this. So one other thing, the last thing is how, how can people get in touch with you? Sure. Yeah, they can. You can find me at Holton Healing Arts. It's my website is HoltonHealingArts.com. And on social media, you can also find me at Holton Healing Arts. Um, and I have lots of different offers for you and programs. And um, we're actually putting out uh, a new quiz that will help you identify what your shamanic archetype is and how to use that to know better who you are and what your gifts are. So that's super fun. Oh, good, 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 good. Well, thank you for being here. Um, it was an honor and I, I feel privileged to have had you here. So thank you so much. And for you guys, I will see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>